Hey everyone, uh, before we begin, the world lost Chadwick Boseman this past week. Uh, he was an actor in Hollywood who had played numerous roles, and the one I am most familiar with is T'Challa, the Black Panther in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And, you know, that's because I'm a comic book fan, you know, and, and I know and enjoy the experience of seeing, you know, my, my heroes come to life. So I can't even begin to fathom, you know, begin to understand what it must have been like to be a child of color you know, thrilling for years to the likes of Batman and Captain America, but to suddenly look up on that big screen and see this honorable king and strong protector of an entire nation that reflected your own black heritage and experience. Chadwick Boseman brought this character to life as more than just a cool costume, because at the heart of these cosmic splash page adventures. Superheroes inspire us to be the honorable and strong version of ourselves that we want to be, um, regardless of what anyone else in society says. And so Chadwick Boseman is a superhero, and may his impact be forever. Kelly's seen another guy. Can you believe it? Who on this campus is cooler than I am? I am. Are you serious? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. All this time you said you were going to wrestling practice? That that red spot on your forehead wasn't a mat burn, it was a hickey. A hickey on my forehead? Uh huh. Yeah, you're right. But if it isn't you, then who is it? Hey, guys. Nah. Well, let me just make sure. So, Screech, where have you been all afternoon long? Visiting the love of my life. Does she have dark hair? As a matter of fact, she does. All over her. Hey, everyone ever, and welcome to 20th Century Pop, the show where we try to understand the present while living in the past. My name is Tim Blevins. <laughs> and I am Bob Canning. And, oh, man... That is a very serious opening. Was that good? It was, that was different. That it was, was enunciated differently. It's like you've got bad news to share. Oh, really? It's, is this our last episode? <laughs> I think the listenership will <laughs> deem that as such. No, what what sounded... I, I know it felt a little off. I was just trying to not be like, hey, hey, because hey, sometimes <laughs> you know, I don't want to force myself into that. That sounds funny. Sometimes the first hey gets lost. And also, like, I, before we recorded, I was telling you I've been nervous that because my voice, if I'm tired, mm-hmm. will sometimes just kind of get all guttural and fade out. So I, I'm, I'm really working on enunciating, but I got a little caught up in it because I'm, I'm extending my mouth muscles. So maybe you were just thinking too much, as you said, the, the opening, and you didn't let just the, the, the free emotion out. Uh, so you just held it steady. It was a very steady opening. It was very steady. It, was it not any good? I can do it again. No, it was it was accurate. It hey, was everyone, accurate ever opening. welcome to the twentieth. I can do. I, I can go through the whole thing. Yeah, you, you want to try something more smarmy? Is that what you're saying? I don't. Was that no? No, I don't. Was that okay. more smarmy? It, I it, I had a. There was a bit of inflection of smarm. Really? I don't. I'm not sure what how that sounds. Then not not the original one. The the one that you were just kind of. Hey, everyone ever. Welcome to see the hey sounded yeah. weird. On it. Yeah. Hey, everyone no, ever. Welcome I think, to. I think we're beyond it now. I think we're okay. I think we're into it. Uh, but it just it just struck me. We're into 20th century pop. Yeah. Sure. We try to understand the present while living in the past. I'm Tim Blevins. <laughs> and I am Bob Canning. Hey. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's what the people want to hear. Thrilled Bob Thrilled. Canning. Uh, we made it, by the time this goes up, well, I've made it to the fall. That's <laughs> what good. What do you think about that? September. That's real good. Is that real good? A lot of things happen in the fall. The leaves change. The leaves change. Yeah. The uh, the temperatures change. The temperatures change. The school year changes. That's true. School, historically, most times, maybe not so much this year. Well, today is a binge podcast episode where we have watched... Uh, four episodes of a particular show from our 
our youth. 1993's Saved by the Bell, the college years. Yeah. Prior to the college ones, did you watch Saved by the Bell, the Saturday morning show when it was on there in high school? I was never a regular viewer of Saved by the Bell. I would catch it here and there. I'd be flipping around. I'd stick on it for a little while. <clears throat> but it was nothing I ever sought out. How about you? No, I didn't really watch it either because I, I thought it was an intrusion on cartoons because it, it was like Saturday mornings are mostly cartoons and that show would come on. I was very aware of this show. Like for some reason, the show did seem big. Yeah. Oh, it was definitely a big show. Um, Saved by the Bell as a whole. I don't know how big the college years uh, could be considered. As we approach it, it's important to look at where this is airing. I mean, this aired our first year of college, 1993. In college, you know, I think about all the sitcoms we watched. You know, I, I'm sure we were watching Seinfeld, but then like Friends, The Single Guy, Caroline in the City, all these metropolitan shows about groups of people fumbling through relationships. And that was appealing. Yeah. This show, I think, is can easily be counted in as one of those shows. And this show kind of predates a lot of those. They don't bring the entire original cast, but they bring they bring four characters in. Uh, we do get the central character, Zach Morris, as you mentioned. We do get A.C. Slater. You get the nerdy character, Screech, by Dustin Diamond. And you get uh, Kelly, played by Tiffany Amber Thiessen. Um, so you're bringing featuring, those four. Featuring Tiffany Amber Thiessen. She's like the, the bonus character, I guess. Or... She wasn't in the pilot. She wasn't originally intended for the show. Originally, it was the three male leads from Saved by the Bell. Um, and then you were introduced to Alex. Uh, who's played by an actress named Kirsten Warren. She's the uh, kind of like the flighty theater student. Yes, also known as Not Lauren Graham. Oh, okay. I knew her as Not Belinda Carlisle in Independence Day. She's the one in Independence Day who holds up the sign on the building that says, Welcome to Earth or whatever. Oh, that's her. I think it's blown up. That's her. Um, but they had her. They had Leslie, performed by Anne-Marie Tremka, who's who was, uh, I think, originally intended to be Zach's love interest. She's kind of a, a blonde Girl, that's kind yeah. of a defining character. Did you say trait. blonde or bland? Well, I think it was both. Okay. She's, okay. Which is, which that's a hard role. That's, and I'm not, that's a hard, not a judgment call on, on the performances. She wasn't given much to do. She's rich, we find out. There was a third female character named Danielle, who was played by a performer named Essence Atkins. And she was dropped after the first episode because I think Tiffany Amber Thiessen expressed interest in, in, in reviving her role. It was nice to see Tiffany Amber Thiessen. I think she was. Um, uh, an actress that I that I followed. I liked her. I don't know. Like I was familiar with all of these characters, so I must have seen some episodes. I think three of them give, or three of the original characters give amazing performances in this. Tiffany Amber Thiessen's character becomes this very interesting neurotic that I don't remember her being. Like I actually, I I I really liked her character. I thought AC. I thought Mario Lopez is AC Slater. I was really impressed by his line deliveries. Like he is, a, you know, he could just be the muscular jock guy, but he's actually understated. Like I find his deliveries engaging. I find the fact that he's not the hero of every scene interesting, and I like watching him. You found him understated. I found him bored. Really, I, I loved his line deliveries. I think okay. I just and then Zach, the Zach Morris character. And maybe it's just the episodes we're watching. He's not on the top of his game. You know, I, I feel like he's not smirking. He's not winking that much at the camera. He's actually not talking to the camera that much, which was a key element of the original one. And do you think that was intentional? Or do you just think that's bad writing? I think it might be changing writing. or They might have forgot the device because he still does it. Like we'll see in a couple episodes, he does for a second turn to the camera. It's very casual. Well, I'm not talking just about that. I'm talking about the fact that he's off his game. Like I could understand that that's like the plot point here, where where Zach is not on his home turf and doesn't have uh, the same um, confidence level that he might have had in high school. To me, I feel like the 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 and again, we're I'm watching it kind of in the middle, so maybe it it led up to this better. But me, I'm I'm seeing him still as the same cocky, narcissistic guy that thinks he's got everything under control, even when it's not under control. Um, and he's just making horrible, bad choices as he, <laughs> he tends does to make do. A lot of bad choices, yes. And I just don't know if that was like the writing of it. It's like, hey, we're going to show Zach go through some problems, but he didn't seem to ever think that he had lost uh, his touch, so to speak. And so that's why I'm like, well, I don't know if this is actually the the message they're trying to give, or 
if he's if they think this is actually an honorable thing for him to be doing in these particular episodes. There's one episode where we'll get into where I, I, I actually think the writing shined. But I feel like the actors have left high school. The actors, I'm not saying their material improved, but maybe being on in prime time, there was some freedom, some space. It was just, it was a new scenario. So I think throwing them into college, they all do a pretty believable performance, I think. Oh, no. I must have left the cage unlocked and she followed me home. Careful, Screech. This is exactly how things started in Fatal Attraction. <laughs> Screech, I'm telling you, you better get this chimp back to the lab before Rogers finds out. I can't, Zach. She loves me. Besides, she's too smart to go to a zoo. I'm going to hide her until I can convince the college that Lucy can talk. Oh, look, it's Lucy. She's so cute. Yeah, get that hairy, disgusting thing out of here. Slater, it's touching me. It's touching me with its monkey paws. I mean, the episode I came in to opens with uh, Dustin and a monkey having a love connection of yes, some that's, sort. That's pretty typical sitcom That's yeah, true. Yeah, and so... So maybe you saw some other I mean, you episodes. might want to explain that a little bit for the audience who hasn't seen it, because it's not, the monkey's not introduced as a real love interest. Um, the, the, the first episode we watched is called Teacher's Pet. It was the 12th episode. It originally aired on December 7th, 1993. They have an anthropology class, and I think everyone's taking it, right? The whole cast is there. Uh, yeah, all of our main, main cast. Professor Lasky. He's sort of like a younger, hip, hip professor, and he teaches the class. He has a monkey in the class, chimpanzee, and he's trying to teach it sign language. And Screech is able to communicate with the monkey. So he kidnaps the monkey and takes him home for a nice little B-plot of keeping the monkey. No, 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 no. He doesn't kidnap the monkey per se. The monkey followed him home. And then he didn't return the monkey. That's a Saved by the Bell in high school A plot, I sure. think. I think <laughs> okay. that's what you'd have an episode where it's the episode where they take a monkey home. It's also the episode where you learn a little bit about ethics with animals, you know, treatment of animals or something like that. Yeah. Fortunately, in this episode of Saved by the Bell, colon, the college years, the writers are mature enough to, re- to, to push that to be B plot material. And what do we get for an A plot? What's what's the thrust or the crux of this episode? Uh, well, um, Kelly has a, a crush on Professor Lasky. Young Professor Lasky, who is not the professor from Boston Common, like I thought he was. I also thought he was the brother on Jesse with uh, Christine Applegate. He was not. also thought um, he delivered my Grubhub order the other day, but that's with a mask, so I couldn't really tell. No, I, I um, interestingly enough, and I don't know if you'll want to use this in, in the episode— I actually know Professor Lasky. Really? Yeah. His uh, kids went to my kids' preschool, so uh, <laughs> we have hung out. you I mean, hung I, out? We're not, we're not best friends, but I know him. Did you know him as an actor at that point? I knew him as an actor. Like, I recognized that he was an actor. I did not recognize him from uh, Saved by the Bell of the College Years. He's in Better Call Saul now. What's the actor's name? Uh, Patrick Fabian. The A plot is that Kelly falls for him, gets kind yes. of a crush on him. Yes. yes. And she winds up babysitting for him. And Kelly hits it off with his daughter. She's falling for the teacher, which is a believable plot. He's kind of falling for her, which I don't know if that's believable. Yeah, it was kind of weird because I, I didn't think they were going to let that happen. And the, You didn't think early 1990s would let that plot happen? Have I you didn't ever watched think Dawson's it was. Because, again, I, I thought it was saved by the bell. I didn't think that they were going to let that happen. But then I was reminded it was the college years. That colon, the college years. Yeah. So that sort of stuff does happen. Kelly, I don't know exactly how you feel about me, but I'm your professor, and the university has very strict rules against you and I getting involved. Look, I know all the rules, but I can't help the way I feel about you. Uh, You'll get over this, Kelly. No, I won't. Professor Lasky, Jeremiah, I'm in love with you. You think that you are, Kelly? No, I'm really in love with you. He does seem to have feelings for her, right? Yeah. Um, I think we see that more in the next episode. Because who else has feelings for her at this point? Uh, for Kelly? Why, Zach, Zach Morris does. Our hero, Zach Morris. Yeah. He tells us, or maybe he told uh, uh, Mario Lopez that he's going to uh, um, uh, confess his love for her. And as much as it's a horrible trait, I think we need to get into it. I can relate to the obsession he has with Kelly. 
And I can relate to the anyone who she would want to be with as a jerk mentality. And those, and that's a that's a horrible thing to relate to, but it was the basis of Friends. It was the basis of a lot of the shows we liked, and this show did it first. So having him have a little competition with someone who's an older man made Zach a little more relatable. You know, he's not just Ferris Bueller unchained. He he's not indestructible. The tone that you're talking about, how Zach is 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 not himself, is not like he was. Um, I don't know if that was intentional. I, I'm not getting a sense that that's what they were going for. What's not intentional about it? I think as the viewer, and, and I think the way they were writing it, they still were writing it as Zach coming out on top. He's got a plan and he's putting it in place and he doesn't he doesn't feel degraded. I mean, I guess he does a little, but he didn't seem... He still is hell-bent on, on destroying that relationship. What you're saying is true. What you're saying also kind of describes Ross Geller. What you're saying, I think, describes my behavior in college. I mean, here's the thing. Zach Morris, as adults in the 21st century looking at him, that's not. those aren't admirable traits. At the time that this aired, right or wrong... Do you think audiences liked Zach Morris? Do you think that the, the the fan base who would applaud every time Mario Lopez picked up a milk carton and his muscle bulged, do you think they liked the Zach Morris character? I think they did, yeah. So seeing him on the show, they're going to root for him. Right. And that's what I'm saying is like you're kind of reading into this as a deeper type of, of character or writing that's happening for Zach. I'm, I'm saying um, that there's something going on. I'm not saying Zach Morris is the deepest character ever committed <laughs> to NBC video. The way they're dealing with Zach is he doesn't have the upper hand. And I think that that's interesting because you're taking someone who was number one at the top of his game, who ruled the school of high school, had the principal around his finger and all these things that make him that jerk, make him that piece of trash from the Zach Morris's trash series. And you're putting that character in a situation where his techniques don't work. I think that is intentional. I think that's how you show growth. I think this show is bent on showing at least some growth for all of these characters. But I guess if you're going into these having already decided not the side with Zach Morris, you're going to have a more current mindset, more mature, more where you are now. I mean, the whole point of this podcast is to to understand our present. Um, and we're learning a lot, I think, from our Somebody said that very well at our the <laughs> Yes. This particular episode, um, my oldest daughter came out. Um, the one we and, just talked about or Kelly and the Professor, the second one we watched? Uh, the, the second one. Episode 13 from December 14th, 1993. Yes. Um, she was watching that episode. Does she know Saved by the Bell? Does she know these characters? No. she. This is completely brand new to her. Uh, didn't know any of it at all. Um, and as it was starting... Uh, and there was the talk of the costume party. Um, I called out, you know, it was pretty obvious what was going to happen, um, that Zach was going to dress up like the professor. Um, Let's and set this up a little bit. Cause people, I know it's uh, hard to believe. Some people may not have watched this yet. Oh, really? Oh, okay. I did. You did. Sure. But listeners, this is a part two to the episode. It starts with Zach talking to the audience, setting up what happened. Kelly and the professor's relationship does progress. Right. Zach finds out and confronts her on it. What about you and me? Zach, look, I'll always love you as a friend, but this is different. I mean, this is a mature man. A man I can see spending the rest of my life with. Oh, Kelly, the man is 32. He's ancient. <laughs> well, what are you guys going to do? Sit around and watch Matlock together? <laughs> he does not watch television. Jerry's an intellectual. Oh, you see? Jerry. I knew it. Well, for your information, Jerry is your professor, and you are still his student. I know. Look, it's a very delicate situation. That's why we have to keep this a secret. You have to promise not to tell anybody, even our roommates. Zach, please, as my friend. All right. All right, I promise. But it's only for you. It's not for Jerry. <laughs> This costume party you're talking about has a Halloween ball going on, and Zach thinks if he dresses up in the same costume Professor Lasky dresses up, he can win Kelly back. That's right. Yeah, he was going to be able to steal a moment with her um, and, uh, and win her back, make her see the light. 
Now, what did your daughter think of this, sitting down watching a little episode out of um, context? She didn't really share her opinion of it, uh, aside from uh, the one thing that I did write down that she said. Um, she she commented on the vibrant, colored, pointless transitions of the oh, show. Yeah. So well, we she, you know what we didn't talk about was that and the theme song. <laughs> yeah. So she noticed these transitions, these, I think, very 90s transitions. Very 90s, very 90s. The opening, like you said, the theme song is very 90s, the... The graphics of the opening, very 90s, and she was she was annoyed by them. She did not care for them. The point I was making is I had to, as we were going through the episode and she was sitting there watching it, I had to make sure that she understood that this is not, what Zach is doing is not nice. It's not good. It's not right. Zach tricks her into kissing him and then reveals himself thinking, this will win you over. It's me, Zach. And she's furious, as she should be, because that's assault. That was the one thing I did, um, uh, was glad that they didn't end up together at the end i thought maybe that's what they would do because that's just what i kind of remember saved by the bell doing and and shows of this caliber doing and so the fact that that didn't work um and that she was called out and pissed off um uh i was happy to see happen right yeah no, I, I thought because that... if, if he had won i'd have even more to explain to my daughter so you would have felt like you had to explain that yeah what i did i did um when they did kiss, my daughter looked over at me and said, did you, because I'm taking notes, and she's like, did you write down that you called it? And I said, no, I wrote down that Zach's a dick. So that was important for you to express that to her. Yes. If you can think back to college, watching this, would you have been turned off by that? Um, in college at that time, if I was watching this, I don't know if it would have turned me off as much. Like like we've been saying, it's it's what we were used to at the time. Zach's behaviors are not far-fetched in that we, it's not like we don't know people who have done that. It's not like you and I haven't done a version of that, or I can only speak for myself. I've done variations on that, manipulating people. That is something that happens at that age. Yeah. You know, you're worried because your daughter was watching it, which sounds like respectable parenting. Does your daughter watch Friends? No, she hasn't watched Friends. Do you, would you let her if she wanted to? Um, I'd like her to be a little older because... Um... Because we're talking about it? Uh, because we're talking about it? No. Um, because, like, Friends is um, pretty overtly sexual, especially in the early seasons. And Didn't she watch The Office? Yeah, she watched The Office. Yeah. I mean, she could probably she could probably watch it now. I mean, I get that this show is problematic, as many sitcoms were, and that's not an excuse for them to be that way. It's just interesting to me... That I, and I'm trying not to right now in conversation, I'll pick and choose what gets to be problematic. Like, I'll acknowledge my issues with friends. I'll acknowledge the problems I have with Ross. But my stomach doesn't churn. I don't stop watching it. I don't walk away from it. I mean, I had to because I'm not going to pay for HBO Max. Going into this show, Zach does seem to be... I mean, also, I think you're just not into this show, which Uh, is fine. That's completely true. But it seems like Zach is the main trigger for that because we've watched bad programming before. We saw a program that had Styles from Teen Wolf uh, working on a TV show with Heather Locklear. We watched an episode of that. Which one was that? That was called Going Places, featuring oh, yeah. the, the performer I don't think we're going to get to because I doubt we're going to keep going, Holland Taylor, who showed up on the show. Does this mean we're not going to get to Robert Guillaume? He was my favorite part. Well, then we can talk about this episode because this <laughs> is an episode called A Question of Ethics. That aired on December 21st, 1993, and surprisingly was not a Christmas episode, which is odd. This felt like a Saved by the Bell episode. The audience goes nuts when Zach enters. I don't know if you remember that. There's like a, lot, a big crowd cheer when he walks in. Yeah, and that, that stood out. Like, like it just didn't seem like it was... It, it, it's almost like this was an episode that they had filmed earlier, like first. But yeah, he's in an ethics class. And the teacher who shows up, who also, by the way, gets a big round of applause, is who? It's Benson, man. It's, well, Robert, <laughs> Robert, Robert Keel. Keel. And he's teaching an ethics class. And this is why this felt, this to me felt like a Saved by the Bell in high school episode. Because it's like, right off the bat, I knew what this episode was going to be. Ethics. Every day of your life, you make ethical decisions. My job is to make you aware of the consequences of those decisions. Imagine, for example, you work for a dress designer. You have an opportunity to appropriate a rival company's hot new idea. What would you do? Me? Design dresses? (laughs) 
No way. Fine, you work for a company more suited to your abilities. You haul manure. <laughs> Would you steal the idea? Well, what for? How many ways are there to haul manure? Well, with your gift for analytical thought, I'm sure one day you'll find out. You've got a tough-as-nails professor coming in, and I saw right away he sets the thing up where he drops a test, Zach gets the test, and now he has the ethical dilemma of, do I read the test to cheat on the test? And it gets passed around the friends, and they have a nice kind of conversation. The the dorm room that they're in, there's a shared common space. Oh, my think, God, the dorm room. Right? That, I liked that set. That's a nice setup. They each that, have their rooms on the opposite sides. That's a nice sides. set for a television show, yes. But that is not a realistic-looking dorm room setup. You've got – it's a, it's basically an apartment. I had to actually, like, really watch it and get an understanding. Are we in an apartment building? Are they off campus? Because it's huge. It's a shared kitchen area. You had one of those in your dorm room. You all had your own rooms, and there's that shared common space. Yeah, it's not. It's certainly not as big as as this place was. It didn't have a common space that had so much room for um, TV like sets eight, so they can move the eight, camera around. I mean, that's the only reason. Piece of, oh no, 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 no I know, I know that it's built for television. Have you seen but Monica's New York apartment? It still throws me. It's bigger, but it's a nice setup because it gets characters can come and go. It's got three doors. I mean, it's a nice three camera sitcom setup. Yeah. And so all the friends are there. They argue over, do we look at the test? Do we not? And Leslie takes a big stance saying no one should cheat. She rips it up and throws it away. And there's a pretty funny sequence where they go to the, uh, Zach and Slater go to the dumpster to retrieve the thrown away test. And it turns out everyone's going to the dumpster and it's, you know, they pull out of the dumpster and the idea is kind of like, are we going to look at it? Are we not? I mean, it's it's your standard kid show setup. Yeah. And on the day of the midterm, the professor comes in and admits that he purposefully dropped the test all over campus. There is no test that it was really just supposed to be a you know passing judgment on yourself. Yeah. And this felt Saturday morningy because there's a lesson. Um, it's circular, and like you said, it could ha- it wasn't connected to a story arc. Right. But it had Robert Guillaume. So. It had Robert Guillaume, and it had Robert Guillaume just tearing down Zach and and Mario and everybody. This episode is also, for what we're talking about, of the four episodes we watched, this one calls out sexual harassment briefly, but it does. The B-plot of this episode, Slater works a work-study job at the uh, cafeteria as a busser. I didn't think you could do this. He just asks other people to cover for him. Yeah. You can't do that, but okay. Screech winds up covering for him, um, and he's working the diner, and he tries to shout out some diner slang. Uh, I forget what's being ordered, but I think he shouts out that he needs a naked chick with hot buns. Yeah, a chicken sandwich, nothing on it, um, on a toasted bun. And he says this to Frau for Bissner, yeah. from Austin Powers, who happens to be <laughs> working there. When he shouts this, she snaps back to him. That's sexual harassment. Yeah. That's her line that she's given that may or may not elicit a response from the audience. And then uh, one of the characters says, um, Screech couldn't sexually harass himself is the unfortunate <laughs> right. rebuttal. To, but 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 I'm just saying I was, I was impressed that it acknowledged that because sexual harassment, unfortunately, was still a joke in the way it was dealt with. But well, I mean, it was a of, joke in that moment, too. Hmm. There are, to hear those words were jarring. I feel sure. like we're watching TV at a time where it's rampant for that. And even that there's an, it's an innocent joke, to be honest. Him just shouting out what he shouted. We could laugh at that and that could be that. Her reaction to it then makes it something else because you're like, oh, this, this person, that's how they're reacting. So you deal with that. And I, I just, that seemed, that was the part of the episode that stuck out where it's like, well, that would not have been on Saturday morning. That's true. When you're coming up against the walls, I don't know the writers of this episode, but when you're coming up against the walls of what TV looks like, sounds like, and how it's produced in 1993, is a line like that, is a moment like that, is the fact that you have that sentence there, is that a writer striving to be something, striving to rise above the genericness of the material? And and should that be applauded? Is that an example of the show at least trying? Um, you could see it that way. I really just see it as a setup for the can't harass himself joke. Okay. In which case, that totally steps all over what I said. I mean, again, there, 
there's we're coming at it, I think, with two different viewpoints um, because I'm still seeing it as writing for the joke and not for a message here. <laughs> Would you want a show full of messages? I mean, that is what the original Saved by the Bell was. They may not be the messages we wanted. And I say that because the last episode we watched was what I thought was going to be the message episode. Yeah, this one... Um... Episode 15, The Rave, which aired January 4th, 1994. I kind of feel like, and maybe I'm remembering it wrong because it was the last one I watched and it was later in the evening. Um, you didn't keep going and watch the rest of the season? I did not watch the rest of the no, season. No, you did not. Is that what you're asking? That is totally no, what I asked. I stopped when The Rave was over. <laughs> a lot of people do. <laughs> um, but I feel like this episode was a little bit about nothing in a way. Like, there, there was like, yeah, I think what you're talking about, the message storyline with the uh, uh, nitrous oxide. I was kind of, ex- I, this was my favorite episode okay. of the four. I actually really enjoyed this. There were moments I laughed out loud. Um, and then we were saying like the terms of ster- uh, serialized plot, this might've been broadcast out of order because this one brings up the Kelly and Professor Lasky plot again. Right. And she even references to it having been a week since stuff had happened. So I'm wondering if stuff was sh- shifted around. Yeah. seems that way. You know, they remind us that Zach and Lasky are, are butting heads over Kelly. And so the, the plot line of this episode is, is I think um, Alex, the theater student, and uh, Slater are dating. Slater wants to take her to, I think, Cancun, but can't afford it because he's working the job. He doesn't have a lot of money. And so Zach thinks that Cancun, if he took Kelly to Cancun, he'd be able to uh, win her back. And he, and he also figures it's going to cost money to do that. So why don't they do a get-rich-quick scheme, which is something Zach is famous for. You know, sitcoms are pretty famous for this. They decide they'll throw, and this is why I could not wait to see how this turned out. They're going to throw a rave to raise money. That's right. Raves were all the rage back then, I guess. Well, this is the thing. This is a sitcom, or normally this would be a Saturday morning sitcom, approaching the topic of a rave. I've never been to a rave, so even my perception of it is off. But I know that they're sexualized. I know that they're, there's aspects of, of uh, intoxication and, and mind-altering things that I'm like, how is this show going to deal with that? So I was, I was ready for a train wreck, to be <laughs> honest, with this episode. But at the same time, it's like they're in college. Yes, kids in college go to raves. This is something that's acknowledging the show is a little older. And so they decide to um, – that they, they rent a warehouse <laughs> – they're going to throw the raid there, but it kind of falls apart. So they eventually end up having it at the apartment. A lot goes on with this. I guess what I'm getting at is there was a plot where two guys ask if nitrous oxide is going to be at the rave. They ask Screech if he can get nitrous oxide. And here's why I thought it was going to become a very special episode. Right. And it doesn't. You know, there, there's, there is a plot line where during the rave, uh, Screech doesn't get the nitrous oxide. He also messes something up and, and Slater kind of tells him you never do anything right, which hurts Screech. That's, feels- that's more of the message plot line of this episode than the drugs. It's the, uh, the Screech's storyline where um, he gets yelled at for being immature. So he tries to be mature and get these guys their drug. Um, and then he feels guilty about it. Yeah. So it's really, if there's a message, it's it's with Screech trying to deal with with uh, growing up with an actual character trait. That's the thing. It, it seems very hard to give Screech a storyline that's not about a monkey or somehow he gets he's got a Hawaiian outfit on or something. So I liked that. I liked that it turned into that. He actually felt like he's not accepted. You actually saw him feeling like nobody likes him. So what does he do? He he, you know, peer pressure, he brings these tanks there. Then he starts to feel bad about it. So he wants to take the tanks back. And this is where I thought it was nice. Slater, before any of this happens, Slater apologizes for what he says to show they're really friends. And then he offers to help uh, Screech out in getting the tanks back. But Screech says, I have to do this on my own. Hey, guys. Guys, look. I made a terrible mistake, and I never should have brought that tank Hey, here. it's all right, man. No, it's not. I want it back. Hey. Hey, Powers, chill. Give it back, man. Is there a problem, man? No. No problem at all. Thanks, Slater. Yeah, you handled it. Oh, no. I made an even bigger mistake than I thought. How's that possible, Screech? Well, I was so nervous when I grabbed the tank, I didn't get the nitrous oxide. This is a tank of helium. (laughs) 
which isn't nitrous oxide. <laughs> Man, you are a geek. Come on, fellas. I laughed out loud at that, to be honest, because it didn't turn it into the lesson of the week. It didn't turn it into a sort of, uh, you know, let's let's argue about drugs. It just it was just a joke. Yeah. The, the ramifications of introducing something like a rave or, a, you know, a party that gets out of control or drugs, they become special episodes when they it's like the sitcom exists in a world. And now we're going to throw this social issue in that has never been there before and never will be. And it just shakes up the entire setup of the show and they have to learn a lesson and rebuild their show. I mean, that's how special episodes work. Different Strokes, you know, Facts of Life, Silver Spoons, Webster, Blossom, and all of these shows had very special episodes where they would deal with a topic that would never again come up. Yeah. And in this show, this would have been their example to do that, but they accepted that, no, this is what college is. These particular characters might not be hip to that or want to partake in that, but they didn't have to learn that lesson. They didn't have to grow that way, and they were allowed to exist in college. And, and I, I thought that was great. And the Saturday morning show would not have been able to get away with that. This episode also introduces a character played by Holland Taylor, who I adore. The dean. She comes in as the dean basically to play the Mr. Belding role. Something that's been missing from the show is an adult authority figure. Yeah, the Bob Golick character never really... Didn't seem to stick or do much. What was that character? Was he a student? Was he an RA? I think was he's like he an both? RA, yeah, teacher. Did you like that character? Because that character didn't work. No, me. it didn't work in these episodes we watched. I know we haven't talked about him, but he, he, I think he is a former, in the show's world, he's a former sports player. Yeah. Who, yeah, again, might be the RA, but he's also a student. So there isn't any really line of distinction. Did I call him than, Bob Golick? That's his name, right? That's his real name. Yeah. His character's was, name Was he is Mike in the show? Mike Rogers. Yeah. This is his character name. And I don't, was he supposed to be the authority figure? Because he's the RA, but he's also their friend and a fellow student. And yeah. barely in the show. Like, I don't know what he was supposed to be. Because um, they were trying something new. Yeah. I feel like you bring in Holland Taylor as this dean who doesn't like Zach, which is even har- a harder line than Mr. Belding, because he liked Zach. Right. But you're giving this new authority figure, so it's weird they're reverting back to. I think the show's tr- the show was canceled shortly after this episode. But I think they were trying to retool it, so I think introducing her to the show was a step back to what they thought pe- was familiar. Right, like they have to turn Zach back into that schemer because otherwise, what was interesting I think before is you're seeing Zach in a world of his peers. They're all freshman students or higher. And without a teacher or someone to hold him accountable, because Professor Lasky doesn't really do it, there's no way for him to shine. And there's nothing to threaten that either. Like, he's just another student there that we happen to be following. And I liked that angle, where in Saved by the Bell, when he was in school, he was the, you know, he was in constant conflict with the principal. Very much the Ferris Bueller type character, which is a character that doesn't work. I know I like the movie, but honestly, that character, that's just lucky casting because that's a that's a jerk character. Right. And that's what Zach was on the original one. I feel like this show was trying to let him be something else and maybe there would be growth and we should get back onto that story arc again. There might be growth or a chance for growth, and this is all retrospectively, in his pursuit of Kelly. But I think they went the safe route and katowed to what Saved by the Bell was. I think... I like the adult. That's why this episode, two things are going on. I like the adult aspect of it, I guess, or the more mature, nothing really happens storyline of the rave. Like I thought Alex as a DJ was pretty funny. I thought just the angles they were doing there, it was entertaining and it was lighthearted, but it was funny. But they also were trying to set up the world, the familiar world of the TV show from Saturday morning. And I don't think that was smart. But you didn't care for this episode, I guess, either. No, I mean, it didn't. I mean, the whole thing. I'm not a Saved by the Bell fan or a Saved by the Bell, the college years convert. So that's yeah, apparent. <laughs> I don't know. I Sorry, Tim. No, I you don't owe me anything. I didn't write it. I enjoyed it. You know, I feel like there are hints that this could have been something, something more. Yeah. And, and, and maybe it's hard because you're not a fan of the source material, but I guess... Do you ever want to see that? Are there shows where you're happy to see characters progress to a new series? 
Um, or are you ever curious about it? Like, I'm trying to think, like, would you want to see Friends a few years after the finale? I might want to. I mean, it all depends on the writing. You know, it all depends on, on what they do with, with the writing and, and the characters. We tried it with Joey. I didn't like Joey. I didn't care for it. Um, they, they did it with Frasier. I liked Frasier. Um, now, why did it work with Frasier, this character of Frasier? Um, I think Frasier... The character is is such a good character that you put him in any situation and you're going to find comedy. Um, and they just smartly put him in a in a situation with his family and a talk show, um, and it just really worked. You had a lot to to work with there. Is he um, the same character as he was on Cheers? Um, I mean, I am not a Cheers expert. I've really? probably seen Frasier more than I've seen Cheers. Really, but I feel like. Yeah, just accessibility wise, access to Frasier. I've had more access to Frasier than I have to Cheers. But you didn't grow up watching Cheers? I watched Cheers uh, when I grew up. I don't know if I wa- watched it every week, but I watched it a lot. Um, but I only watched it that week. It's not like Frasier where it's in syndication. Cheers, I didn't, well, I guess Cheers was in syndication for a time. Forever. Yeah, very long time. Yeah, I just think uh, I've kind of lost your question, but I think, yeah, Frasier is. He grows as a character. He changes as a character, but still maintaining his 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 core, I guess. Um, if they had brought other characters with him, do you think he would have been able to change? Like, he is the only character yeah, no, from I, Cheers in that environment. I think that's so he, the way to do it. I don't think he would have brought – I don't think he would have brought his, his – Lil- if it was with Lilith, I don't think it would have worked. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's okay to see Lilith once in a while, but – not to but didn't you want them to be the together when they were on Cheers? Didn't you want that coupling then? No, I don't think I did. Oh. I don't think I was rooting I for I love that. Frazier I thought they were Lilith. great together. No? I mean, I enjoyed watching them go through their, their issues. I did too, and I think you can do that in a relationship. I don't know. I don't know if... And we're living in an age, I think, where we, we keep getting follow-ups. You know, we got the Will and Grace follow-up. And we did an episode of that, but you get Roseanne. You get other shows coming back, and then rumors of a full house even end. I don't know about that because I, I feel like there are periods in shows that we relate to. Like I grew up loving the Brady Bunch. Like that was one of my favorite shows. It was syndicated when I was watching it, but I adored those characters. I adored them as kids. It had been off the air for probably 15 years at that point, but I just kept watching it. And that show ends. The last episode includes Greg's graduation. And then that's it for the series. And, and I feel like that's, that's a nice division that works like if the show had kept going and greg was in college and even the shows when they tried to bring it back and they were older there those shows aren't relevant because i feel like there's a cycle and invested in the characters that already happened that there isn't a long-term life for a lot of these things and i think friends is an example of this on friends like i know we liked it all when we watched it but when i watch it now you know two decades since it got off the air when I look back at it. I think the quality of that show and the entertaining aspects of it kind of dip around the time Chandler and Monica, Monica begin planning their wedding. Oh, sure. You know, I think once it's out in the open, because that, I, that suddenly doesn't fit the setup of the show. You know, yeah. That's a show about I recognize that then, though. You didn't recognize that then? No, I think I still liked it. I think I was still watching it. I was still I, watching it and enjoying it, but I, I still could tell that this just wasn't as entertaining um, as as the seasons prior. I guess I didn't have that yet. I mean, by the 10th season, I guess I was getting a little bored of it, but it was all new still. I guess I'm talking like when you look at stuff in history, like I don't watch episodes past when he proposes to her. I don't like those episodes. I find those episodes, I don't watch any of them again now. I feel like there's a cycle that characters can go through. And I guess Saved by the Bell was a high school show. And I was not invested or interested in it. And it's just these characters and who they are in high school that maybe we don't need to see their, the next step. But I liked that they tried. And I feel like they really tried to A do something effort. different. Hey, was that? A for effort. I doubt you're giving it that. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm going to watch the rest of them because I am curious. Um, I am not, Tim. No, I know. That's, that was clear before, really, we got into this uh, train wreck of an episode, but to follow up on something, just because I am curious, are you concerned with the relationships, like the TV relationships that your daughters see, the portrayals of that? Um, 
Well, yeah, sure. I'm going to be concerned. Um, I mean, I'm concerned about every little aspect of everything she's introduced to uh, on television, pop culture, in real life. So, of course, I will be concerned. Um, do I feel like shows are doing a better job now than than maybe they did in the early 90s? Honestly, I don't know because I'm not watching enough of it. I can't tell you. I can't make a blanket statement that I don't have to be worried because we're modern and, and, and further on and, and smarter and better. But do you think people should have been worried with us second year of college watching a show like Friends? Um, it was a different time. I don't know that my mother would have been worried. Well, that's a different person. I mean, but what does that mean? Do you think, do you think we were rampantly watching stuff that was not good to be watching? Like, do you think these kind of storylines, these plot arcs were detrimental to us as the target demographic? I mean, we've talked about that before, that in some ways they are, um, because in some ways we, we, we try to live that life and maybe sabotage certain situations and relationships because that's the only thing that's the only way we've seen it play out in front of us on television is that there has to be some sort of conflict so we don't retroactively leave that stuff we don't like you don't tire of friends do you you don't you can still watch it i can still watch certain seasons sure but you don't think your daughters are ready to um they probably are now uh, as we talked about earlier, there was a time where I thought, okay, they, they watched The Office, they could probably watch Friends, and then we started watching Friends, and I was like, no, 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 they're not quite old enough yet. I'd, I'd prefer them to be a little older. Was um, it just like sex and conversation about sex, or are there aspects of these characters that you think? Um, it was it was mostly the conversations about sex, um, but then it does get into uh, relationships and, and sex, um, whereas The Office, you at least had silly um, office characters and just goofiness. Um, most of season one of Friends is sex. Do you let your kids watch Seinfeld? No, I haven't introduced them to Seinfeld. I don't think they're, you know, they're not the age that Seinfeld would make sense to them. I don't okay. think. Huh. Yeah, I don't know why we chose to watch these. I say we. I did. I yeah, picked this you as chose. a topic. I, I thought know. it was I mean, really. I thought it was going to go somewhere. I thought yeah, it's college, it's school year, and it's a it's a, a continuation of a show. Which and the two takeaways I have is one, we've done a lot of episodes, so we've kind of already done these conversations. But two, I think, like you said, what do we care? <laughs> this is actually a show that, while it was, this is a good example of something like this was actually made for us. We were the demographic of Saved by the Bell, the college years, and the original Saved by the Bell, yet we weren't invested in it, showing that there's some freedom to choose what we do and don't want. Yeah. So given that, yeah, maybe it's, what's the point of talking about it? <laughs> it's it's a great, great thing to, to come to an understanding of at the end of the episode. The end of this episode. Correct. Of, a 20th century pop. So, I, meaning, if you want to hear an episode that we do well, you know, maybe something that, that worked, <laughs> why don't you check out the Not a Holograms webpage of nahpods.com? That's the home site uh, for this show, 20th century pop, other shows as well. You can always find, well, right now you'll find this episode, but, you know, normally, you know, next week it'll be that week's episode. You can always find the most recent episode there as well as links to all of the past episodes, all of which are probably superior to this one and this one's topic. Uh, you can also follow us there on Instagram at 20popcast, Twitter at 20popcast, and if you want to give the show a chance past this episode, you know, with one of the other topics, if you're one of those people who are like, well, just because that went horrible doesn't mean they all follow that route. There aren't that many other Saved by the Bell spinoffs. There's two, you know, two rounds of the new class there's the Hawaiian vacation and the wedding movie. But, you know, as long as those aren't our topics, if you want to check out a future episode, why not subscribe? There's links on the home page or on the webpage for 20th Century Pop. We can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and some other ways that you listen to podcasts. I can see why these numbers are going to be so low. Um, I'm a little disappointed because I, re- I thought we were doing the Vegas wedding next. <sighs> But I guess we're not. There goes that up, audience. Or there, here comes back that audience. We are not doing it. 
Um, do you wanna? Are you just too embarrassed to plug yourself? No, no, no. Um, you can follow me on Twitter as well at rhcan. Um, as always, I ask uh, listeners to reach out, um, connect with us, let us know if there is a different opinion that you may have of Saved by the Bell. I know that there are Saved by the Bell super fans out there. Plenty of I am one not of one of them. them. Thought I was going to become one, but I did not, I guess. Yeah, I'm no. more of a college years kind of guy. I really dug those maybe 19 episodes, 13 episodes. I don't know how many it was. Uh, it was enough. This was, this was awful. This was really... <laughs> this was a struggle just to get through. This would be a horrible finale, but it doesn't leave any hope that the next one is going to be better. Next week is a rerun, so that might have some saving points. But but yeah, this this really, this blue, would you say this is maybe I our, think you're going to find some gold in here, Tim. I think you're going to do some editing magic. I think you're reading this off of somewhere. You think there's going to be gold? You're going to find, you're going to do some editing magic, sir, and you're going to find uh, uh, about 12 minutes of, of good podcast. Did you say dishonest magic? I did not say that. Okay. Oh, we'll see. I said, go back and listen to it now. Editing. I got offended the other day. I took one of those BuzzFeed quizzes about I, one, I hit, offensive. one Hit Wonders. Yeah. Um, and I was able to pick out most of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they put the Cardigans in there as a one-hit wonder, and I disagree. They had a couple other good songs. I think you had the album with those songs on it. They're, they're talking about, like, with radio hits, right? Because all these musicians have albums with multiple songs. Well, no, they had another radio hit. What was their first one? The Love Fool was the first one. Is that and the I can't... Love Me, Love Me, Say That You Love Me song? Uh, Yes. Okay, and then what was their second big hit on the radio? I can't remember the name of it. They don't it was, have one. I it was a heavier sounding. Mm. It, it was it was a more rockin' song. Was it on the radio or was it a hit? It on was the on radio? WBCN Boston. Okay, sure, but was it a hit? I because you, presumed, the fan of the song, don't even know what the song is. I presumed it was a a hit. But still, what was it? What was the song without looking I, it up? I don't know. So you don't know it? I don't know it. It's not a hit. hit. I guess it was just a song. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like I I I I, I think. I get what you're saying, because, I mean, Aha is not a one-hit wonder. They had a song in a fucking James Bond movie, but they're considered one-hit wonders on the basis of Take On Me. I guess that's true. Yeah. Wings, they have that song from the James Bond movie as well, but that's it. Mm. One-hit wonders, man. Bob Dylan and the band have a version probably of Maggie's Farm, but nothing else. Art Garfunkel, name two hits by him. Can't do it. Because he only has one. I hate Mondays. Or I don't like Mondays. It's actually the Boomtown Rats. It would be funny if it was Art Garfield. That's probably what I was thinking. And that's not his name. It's Garfunkel. My favorite game. That's the other Cardigan song. So you looked it up. I had to. Because it's not a hit. But I know it. uh, Now that I've seen the title, I can sing it in my head. Is it the Wikipedia entry? Where did it place on the charts? Um, let me see. I didn't go that deep. Well, <sighs> well, that's my response. Interesting facts. Number 14 in the UK. Mm-hmm. Well, BuzzFeed is an American conglomerate. <laughs> All right. I'm ready when you are, sir. Well, now I'm thinking of other songs by the Cardigans. Oh, wait, there aren't any. There are a one-hit wonder. So, yeah, let's start this. All right.